the whole term and the whole measuring of vertical leap began, I think, with David Thompson. He vaulted off the ground, exploded off the ground. One of the coolest nicknames ever, Skywalker, because he lived above the rim. Oh, and also because his reported 48-inch vertical leap and more impressive 44-inch standing leap, making him one of the greatest athletes in the history of sports. He dominated the college ranks as arguably the best player in the nation and one of the greatest players in NCAA history during his three-year varsity career with the NC State Wolfpack, where he led the team to their first national championship and did so as a 6'4 guard at a time when all the best players were big men. He was a double first overall pick in the NBA and ABA, but would begin his career for the ABA's Denver Nuggets, where as a rookie, he was already being placed in the same conversation as Julius Irving. Along with Irving, he revolutionized the game with his above the rim play and popularization of the alley-oop, but his hops also made him one of the best rebounding guards of all time and one of the first great shot blocking guards. He spent another six years with the Nuggets after the NBA-ABA merger, but an injury in the middle of his career would lead to addiction and it would be this addiction that would quickly derail an all-time great career. He was able to recover, but once things seemed like they were getting back on track, a freak injury at a nightclub would end his career, as he was out of the league at 29 years old, a time where most players are in their prime. And even though he left so much on the table during his career, there's no denying that David Thompson, at his best, was one of the greatest players to ever step foot on a court. So let's take a look at the career of the Skywalker, David Thompson. David Thompson reportedly was already dunking as a 5'8 8th grader and would attend Crest Senior High School. This was a tough situation for Thompson, as Crest had just started desegregating after the 1954 Brown vs. Board of Education trial. However, North Carolina schools took over a decade to begin complying to this ruling. But there was one place where he was treated equally, and that was on the school basketball team under coach Ed Peeler. But something he wouldn't be doing in high school was dunking, as dunking was outlawed in high school and college until 1977 due to the dominance of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then Lou Alcindor, from being able to dunk so easily. So amateur basketball implemented the no dunk or Lou Alcindor rule, meaning one of the highest flyers of all time would not be able to throw down any in-game dunks during high school or college. But nonetheless, during his time at Crest, he broke numerous records, was All-State as a junior and senior, and was North Carolina Player of the Year as a senior in 1971, and he would hold the school scoring record for over 20 years. Additionally, as a senior, he led the Chargers to a 20-0 record and the Southwest Conference title. Thompson would stay in state and attend North Carolina State after they won a bitter recruiting battle with Duke to secure Thompson's services. As a freshman, he would not play on the varsity team, but playing on the junior team would prove to be no challenge for Thompson, as he led all freshmen in scoring with nearly 50 points per game. The 1972 Wolfpack under Norm Sloan had gone just 16 and 10, but would now welcome a sophomore Thompson, who would join a 5'7 point guard named Monty Tao and a 7'2 center named Tom Burleson, as the three would form one of the nation's best trios, known as the Circus Team. As a sophomore during the 73 season, Thompson was voted first team all-conference, Conference Player of the Year, and a consensus first team All-American. The Wolfpack had a top five offense and one of the toughest schedules in the nation, but they would defeat rival UNC, led by Thompson's future teammate Bobby Jones on three separate occasions, and beat a stacked Maryland team four times, including for the ACC championship. By the end of the year, the Wolfpack had yet to experience defeat and would rank as the second best team in the nation, as Thompson had put up averages of about 24 and a half points and eight rebounds per game. But their name was nowhere to be found on the tournament bracket. And that goes back to the NC State-Duke recruiting battle. Duke and NC State had been both given one-year tournament bans for recruiting violations involving Thompson. Duke invited Thompson for an illegal visit and purchased clothes for him. But NC State had been charged with eight separate recruiting violations, some that involved Thompson and some that didn't. But regardless, it would keep one of the two undefeated teams in the nation out of the tournament. The Wolfpack were back with their big three for 1974, and the sanctions were lifted. All three players upped their scoring as NC State had the nation's fourth highest scoring offense and played the toughest schedule out of all teams. Thompson would again be ACC Player of the Year, First Team All-ACC, and a consensus First Team All-American. But their quest for another undefeated season would come to an end quickly as after a 2-0 start, they would lose to the only other undefeated team from last year and seven-time defending national champion UCLA. But after this, the Wolfpack would win their next 22 to finish the year at 24-1 and earn the program's first ever number one national ranking. They would get a rematch with Maryland in the conference championship in what would go down as one of the greatest games in college basketball history. After Maryland got out to a big first half lead, 
the Wolfpack were able to retake the lead late in the game, but Maryland would rally to force overtime, where the Wolfpack would prevail 103-100 to to get a tournament berth. NC State would get a first round bye before playing Providence in the regional semifinals, where Thompson would go off for 40 points and 10 rebounds on over 55% shooting. The regional final brought Pittsburgh, who they would defeat in a blowout. However, Thompson would have just 8 points on 3 of 4 shooting, as after about 10 minutes, he was knocked out of the game with a head injury and he would leave the game on a stretcher. And if he couldn't go in the final four versus UCLA, NC State had virtually no chance. Luckily, the injury wasn't serious and the Wolfpack would have Thompson back for the final four. This would be a tough game and after regulation, the teams were tied at 65. As this was the pre-shot clock era, the first overtime saw each team score just two points, leading to a second overtime where UCLA jumped out to a seven point lead and looked on their way to another national championship appearance. But a furious push led by Thompson, who would ultimately finish with 28 and 10, would give the Wolfpack a three point win to end UCLA's legendary streak as NC State would advance to their first national championship game. The final would be NC State versus Marquette, but this game would be an easier 12 point win for the Wolfpack as Thompson would put up 21 points and be named the final four most outstanding player as the Wolfpack were national champions. And for his regular season, he would put up about 26 points and 8 rebounds per game. Burleson had graduated, so going into his 1975 senior season, Thompson had to do a lot. The Wolfpack had a balanced attack, but Thompson was far and away the best player. He would have his best individual season, putting up nearly 30 points and 8 rebounds a game, en route to his third consecutive conference player of the year, first team all-conference, and consensus first team all-American, while also being named the national player of the year. Even though NC State had the second ranked scoring offense, they again had the toughest schedule in the nation. And after losing just one game across his first two seasons, Thompson and the Wolfpack lost five during the regular season. However, Thompson did do something he had never done before, as in his final home game versus UNC Charlotte, he dunked a breakaway. However, it was disallowed and Thompson was teed up. The Wolfpack made it to the conference championship game versus North Carolina, but would lose. And because they couldn't win their conference, they would not receive a tournament berth. They would receive an NIT invitation, but turn it down and Thompson would be quoted as saying that the NIT is more of a loser's tournament. But Thompson finished the season averaging about 30 points and 8 rebounds per game. Thompson had a big decision to make during the summer of 1975, as not only was he the first overall pick by the NBA's Atlanta Hawks, he was also the first overall pick by the ABA's Virginia Squires. The Atlanta Hawks had also drafted center Marvin Webster third overall, and it didn't look like they would have the funds for both players as Thompson's price was reportedly going to cost a minimum of $2 million in total. Ultimately, the Hawks would sign Webster for $1.5 million and definitely didn't have the money left to sign Thompson. And it didn't help that they were still recovering from a $400,000 fine in 1972 due to signing violations involving the current face of the ABA in Julius Irving. And just for reference, that was a top player salary back then. So that would be like fining a team upwards of $30 million today. So it looked like the ABA for Thompson, but the Squires, who became notoriously well known for fumbling all-time great talent, conceded the draft rights to the Denver Nuggets, who would sign Thompson to a six-year, $3 million contract. The Nuggets went to league best 65 and 19 in 1975, and it added a generational prospect in Thompson. Oh, and would you look at that, the rich get richer. Prior to the season, five-time All-Star and ABA champion Dan Issel was traded from the Kentucky Colonels to the Baltimore Claws. But the Claws went under before the season started, and while they were strapped for cash, they sent Issel to the Nuggets for next to nothing, so he could join Thompson and other stars like Ralph Simpson and Bobby Jones, as they were coached by a young Larry Brown. The Nuggets were expectedly the fastest and highest scoring team in the ABA, and would finish with the league best 60-24 record. And forget Thompson being the best rookie in the league, he was arguably the best player. He would finish third in the league in scoring as part of a great Nuggets starting five and he would do so while shooting over 51% from the field. He would hit double figures in every game, have 27 games with at least 30, and even go for 50 in a February 27th win versus San Antonio. And the best part is, he would do all this while finally being allowed to dunk the ball. As on top of the ABA encouraging dunking, they also implemented the three-point line years before the NBA brought it in. Thompson's great year saw him voted to his first and only ABA All-Star game, where he would win MVP of the game with 29 points while also participating in the first ever slam dunk competition, where he would finish as a runner-up to Dr. J. He would be named Rookie of the Year and make the All-ABA second team as the Nuggets got a first round bye and would take on the Artis Gilmore-led Kentucky Colonels in the semifinals. The series would go the distance as both teams fought hard, 
but Denver would ultimately win after a Game 7 blowout. Thompson was incredible, as he led all scorers with nearly 25 a game and did so on over 50% shooting, as he would drop a game-high 40 in the series deciding Game 7. Denver advanced to the ABA Finals, where they would take on league MVP Julius Irving and the New York Nets. This series would be a legendary battle between the two stars. Thompson would again lead his team in scoring at over 28 a game on nearly 57% shooting, while leading all scorers with 32 in Game 3 and an overall postseason career high of 42 in Game 6. But the Nuggets would fall in 6, as with as good as Thompson was, Irving was better. He would average about 38 points and 14 boards on 59% shooting for the series, as he was named playoff MVP. And for Thompson's rookie year, he averaged about 26 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. The ABA was losing money quick and on the verge of folding altogether. But then on June 17, 1976, the ABA merged with the NBA, creating a 22-team league by absorbing four ABA teams in the Nets, Nuggets, Indiana Pacers, and San Antonio Spurs. The Nuggets were the same team for the most part, but had traded away Ralph Simpson in the offseason. Nonetheless, they still featured three future Hall of Famers in their starting lineup, and the trio of Thompson, Issel, and Jones combined for over 63 points per game. And Jones would also put up over two steals and two blocks per game. Thompson would play and start all 82 games, hitting double figures in 81 of them, which included four games with at least 40, as he would finish as the league's fourth best scorer, while again shooting over 50%. Thompson would find himself voted to his first NBA All-Star game, as well as be named first team All-NBA. Although the NBA presented much stiffer competition, Denver was still able to win their division with a 50-32 record. This would get them a first round bye, and then a semi-finals matchup versus Bill Walton and the Portland Trailblazers. The series would end in six games, as a complete performance from Portland would be too much for Denver. Thompson would score his NBA postseason career high with 40 in a Game 3 loss, and Portland would then go up 3-1. And although Thompson scored 31 in Game 5 to keep the Nuggets alive, he managed just 17 points before fouling out late in Game 6 in a Blazers blowout win. And for the regular season, he averaged about 26 points, 4 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. 1978 would be the most iconic season of Thompson's career. The trio remained with Thompson again leading the team in scoring, while also putting up career-high rebound and assist averages for his time in the NBA, on a career-high 52.1% shooting, while averaging over a steal and a block per game. As he would finish third in MVP voting, the Nuggets had dropped to below 50 wins as they would finish with just a 48-34 record. But this season would be defined by a legendary scoring race between Thompson and the Spurs' George Gervin. Thompson played 80 games and put up double-figure scoring in every game, which included 26 games with at least 30 and 7 games with at least 40. But going into the final game of the year, Gervin, who had played an entire season, meaning two more games than Thompson, had scored 14 more points on the season. And as Thompson recalls, going into an April 9th game versus Detroit on the last day of the year, with the Nuggets already having their playoff seating locked up, head coach Larry Brown asked Thompson if he wanted to go for the scoring title. And although Thompson would later say he didn't care either way, he sure played like he cared. Thompson started the game by scoring a then record 32 points on 13 of 14 shooting in the first quarter, and would continue that tear with 21 in the second quarter to give him 53 at halftime. But then the Pistons started basically sending the whole defense at Thompson in the second half, as he managed just six third quarter points and would then cap off his incredible game with 14 in the fourth quarter, in what ended up being a Nuggets loss, as Thompson went 28 of 38 from the field and 17 of 20 from the line, and did this without the existence of the three point line to finish with 73 points, which at the time was the highest single game total of anyone not named Wilt Chamberlain. So Gervin went into his final game of the year versus New Orleans later that evening needing 59 points to capture the scoring title. First, he would break Thompson's points in a single quarter record set just hours earlier, with 33 in the second quarter. And once he had 53 of his own by halftime, Thompson knew it was over, as Gerben would finish with 63, to take the scoring title by seven one hundredths of a point. But now it was playoff time, and the Nuggets would get another bye, then play the Bucks in the semifinals. Thompson would continue his dominant scoring, leading all scorers with over 26 per game, and pulling off a memorable poster on Bucks star Brian Winters. But the series was close, as Thompson had at least 20 in all but one game in the seven-game series. But when the Nuggets needed him most, he delivered, with a game-high 37 on over 53% shooting in Game 7. The conference finals brought the Seattle Supersonics, and although Thompson would get his points as the series' leading scorer at nearly 24 a game, Sonic's lockdown defender Dennis Johnson made him work for it, 
as he had just one game with over 23 points and four games shooting below 42% as the Nuggets lost in six. And for the regular season, Thompson put up about 27 points, five rebounds, and four and a half assists per game as he had earned his second straight All-Star selection as well as his second and final first team All-NBA selection. About a week and a half after his 73 point game, when Thompson's stock was highest, he had also become the highest paid player in the league when he signed a five year extension worth $750,000 per year. So he looked like a nugget for years to come. But with any signing of this magnitude, it was met with criticism. However, Thompson likely would have preferred if his coach wasn't one of his critics. The Nuggets trio was no more, as during the offseason, they had traded Bobby Jones to the Sixers for George McGinnis, which is now one of the greatest robberies in NBA history, but at the time seemed like a fair trade, as McGinnis had also starred in the ABA before becoming a regular 20 and 10 guy in the NBA. However, questions followed McGinnis about his desire to be great, but reportedly Brown had to have him, and the trade was made, and apparently after McGinnis' first practice with the team, Brown demanded GM Carl Shear to trade him as he wouldn't play the way Brown demanded. And although McGinnis' time in Denver was short-lived, he would play 76 games for them during the 79 season to help create a new trio, who were putting up over 63 points per game. With the added scoring of McGinnis, Thompson's scoring dropped to below 25 per game for the first time in his career, but he would still be sixth in the league. He would hit double figures in 73 games and would again be voted an all-star, where this year he would win the game's MVP after leading the West with 25 points in a win. But going back to Brown, Maybe his unhappiness with McGinnis was more serious than it seemed, as after a 28 and 25 start, he would step down as coach, citing physical issues due to tension, and he had already expressed frustration around his team's desire to win throughout the year. So assistant Donnie Walsh would take over, and the Nuggets would go 19 and 10 the rest of the way, to finish at 47 and 35. Denver would be playing in the first round of the playoffs for the first time since entering the NBA, as they had not won their division, and their inaugural first round series would end in a defeat, as they would lose to the Lakers two games to one. Thompson dominated again, leading all scorers with 28 a game to go along with seven rebounds and four assists on over 55% shooting, while also getting about 22 points from Issel. But the difference maker was that they were without McGinnis, who missed the entire series with an ankle injury, as the Lakers won the series deciding game three by a single point. And for the regular season, Thompson averaged about 24 points, three and a half rebounds, and three assists per game. Walsh remained head coach going into the 1980 season, and the team began the year with their trio of Thompson, Issel, and McGinnis. But for the first time since he became a professional, Thompson wouldn't lead his team in scoring, as Issel would be the team's top scorer, and Thompson would shoot below 50% for the first time in his career, on a career-low 46.8% shooting. In unfamiliar territory, the Nuggets were struggling this year. On February 1st, they were sitting at just 19-37, and 37, as McGinnis had taken a massive step back scoring-wise. So to redeem themselves from the trade to acquire McGinnis, they sent him to the Indiana Pacers for a first round pick and a young up and coming star who would become the face of the franchise for the next decade in Alex English. And English would show his scoring ability in the 24 games he played for Denver this year. But his addition wasn't enough as the Nuggets went just 30 and 52 and missed the playoffs. And for the regular season, Thompson averaged about 21 and a half points, four and a half rebounds and three assists per game. But as you can see, the Nuggets had been without Thompson for most of the year. Thompson had been dealing with plantar fasciitis for most of the season, which had kept him out of a few games in the first half of the year, but it would eventually be a torn heel ligament, which would shut him down for the remaining 36 games of the year. However, this injury was what began the downfall of the Skywalker. David Thompson had originally experimented with cocaine after looking for a boost due to suffering from the fatigue that came with playing over 100 games as a rookie. He had continued using it, but up to this point he would only do it occasionally. Thompson didn't love the fame that came with being a star, and felt overwhelmed by the pressure and blame that was placed on the injured star after the Nuggets' poor season. So during the time he was injured, he began abusing it, as it became a daily habit, and it became priority, as Thompson distanced himself from the team, missed flights, and was late for practices. And obviously something was going on with Thompson, but at this point his addiction wasn't public or confirmed. So the Nuggets were looking towards next season and having their star player, who would still be just 26 years old, return and bring them back to winning basketball. However, not before Nuggets management reportedly asked Thompson to return some of his contract money and write a letter apologizing to season ticket holders for his poor season. And Thompson gave every indication that he was back in 1981. The Nuggets once again rolled out an elite scoring trio with Thompson, English, and Issel combining for over 71 points per game. But Thompson was once again the leading man as he would play 77 games to lead the team in scoring and do it on over 50% shooting, 
as he would be the 5th best scorer in the league. He would hit double figures in all but one game and drop at least 40 in 4 games. The Nuggets were the fastest paced team and top scoring offense, but also featured the worst scoring defense. They got off to a bad start as they were 11-20 on December 16th, when they would fire Walsh and replace him with assistant Doug Moe. Under Moe, they would go 26-25, but their 37-45 record still wasn't enough for a playoff berth. And for the regular season, Thompson put up about 25.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Moe remained as coach going into 1982, and the Nuggets would still have a trio, each scoring at least 20 a game. But Thompson was no longer a part of that. Prior to the season, he had suffered a knee injury which kept him out of the team's exhibition games. Then he would suffer a back injury that would cause him to miss a lot of the first half of the year. And during that time, a new scorer stepped up in Denver, in the second year forward Kiki Vandeweghe, which made a 27-year-old Thompson expendable and made him feel like the odd one out. Thompson would also be suspended for two games for arriving late to a Christmas Day game, as he would lose his starting spot to TR Dunn. He would still play 61 games, but start only 5 of them, and would only get about 20 minutes per game. His scoring was still evident as he was the team's top bench scorer at nearly 15 a game, but he was no longer the superstar in Denver. And when you're coming off the bench after being made the highest paid player in league history just a few years earlier, fans start to turn on you, and Thompson's addiction would begin spiraling out of control. The Nuggets would make their return to the playoffs with a 46-36 record, but would lose to Phoenix in the first round. Thompson would again be the team's top reserve as the only bench player to average double figures, but less than 12 points per game from David Thompson was a far cry from what he once was. And for the regular season, he would put up about 15 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. Denver decided to move forward with their young duo, and Thompson was not part of those plans. So on June 18th, they sent him to the Sonics. Thompson's addiction struggles were said to be in the past, but at the time of the trade, the Denver police were currently investigating multiple unnamed Nuggets players, so the trade still was a risk. Thompson joined a Sonics team 5 years removed from a title, and still led by a lot of those title winning players, in guys like big man Jack Sigma, long range specialist downtown Freddie Brown, and star point guard Gus Williams. But a motivated Thompson, in what should be his prime, paired with Williams, seemed like a lethal backcourt, and that's exactly what it was to begin the year. The Sonics would go 12-0 to start the season, with Thompson averaging over 21 per game. But after this, his scoring would decline in each of the next 4 months. However, after the Sonics' great start, Thompson's knee had locked up, which caused him to be placed on the disabled list and miss 8 games. And Thompson would say he probably rushed back too quickly, and therefore wasn't really playing at 100% when he returned. Even though Thompson's numbers were nowhere close to his usual production, he was still voted an all-star starter where he dropped 10 points in his final All-Star appearance. The Sonics would end up going 48-34, but would lose to Portland in a two-game round one sweep, as Thompson would put up just 12 points per game on 36% shooting. And for his first year in Seattle, he would average about 16 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. But Thompson's addiction troubles were not in the past. He reportedly had began ramping up his drug use mid-season, and it eventually got to the point that he came to coach Lenny Wilkins late in the year and admitted he needed help as he couldn't quit on his own. The Sonics would agree to help him, however they didn't get him into rehab until after the season was over, in early May. Thompson would complete a 30 day stay, and appeared much healthier going into the 84 season, but his contract had expired, and after a holdout early in the year, he would re-sign with the Sonics, but had already missed about 2.5 months. He would play his first game of the year on January 18th, and was beginning to find his stride in late February, after a 3 game stretch averaging about 25 a game. But on March 10th, with the Nuggets in New York, with the game against the Nets the next night, they went to Studio 54 nightclub, where Thompson got into a fight, which led to him falling down some stairs and tearing his MCL and PCL in his left knee. Investigations led to police concluding he was sucker punched, which led to him falling down the stairs. But this sucker punch would end his career, as he never played another game after his injury. So for the 19 games he played this year, he put up about 12 and a half points, 2.5 rebounds, and half an assist per game. This injury also derailed Thompson's substance abuse recovery journey, as after being released by the Sonics in 85, he would attempt to come back by trying out for the Pacers later that year, but he would be arrested later that night for public intoxication, and his life would spiral out of control over the next two years, ultimately landing him in jail. But in 1988, he would get sober and stay sober, as he is now reportedly 35 years drug free. Without the addiction, David Thompson is a name that could very well have been in the GOAT conversation. 
He was a true once-in-a-generation talent who could do it all on the court. He was an unstoppable scorer, a great rebounder at 6'4", one of the first great shot-blocking guards, and helped revolutionize the game with his exciting above-the-rim play. He led NC State to unmatched greatness before becoming an ABA legend in a single season, and carried that over to what began as an all-time great NBA career. He entered the league during a time where drugs were everywhere, and as a shy farm kid from small-town Shelby, North Carolina, he was nowhere near prepared for the fame and money that was going to be thrown at him, and unfortunately turned to drugs to deal with that pressure. He was a good guy by all accounts, who made some bad decisions, but the years of great basketball he gave fans will never be replicated. And when you're the player that Michael Jordan models his game after, that's really saying something. But that's it for today's episode on the Skywalker, David Thompson. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on his brief Seattle teammate. Or this one on another player who ended a UCLA streak. Thanks for watching and see you next time.